Welcome back to Dark Realm Tales. A few weeks ago, we did a video about chilling interviews on Death Row. If you haven't watched it, please go check it out. Today, we have our second part of the series with four more interviews with psychopaths that will leave you completely freaked out of your mind. Not everybody is a serial killer in this series. There are some sex offenders as well. Be warned that these interviews contain a lot of graphic content that could be disturbing to many of you. Edmund Kemper. For two months I hadn't killed. And I said, it's not going to happen to any more girls. It's got to stay between me and my mother. And it's got to, I can't get away from her. We're still fighting. She's still belittling me. She's still, I'm like a puppet on a string. And I entertain her. She knows all my buttons and I dance like a puppet with that pain. And it had even gotten physical to where I had physically grabbed her and thrown her onto her bed trying to emphasize a point that she's threatening to kill her. So here I pick up these two young ladies in Berkeley on Ashby Avenue. One has flowers in her hand, petite little dolls. They're in granny dresses and they're hitchhiking, a couple of real experts. I want to see how together I am, if I can resist this temptation. Get in my car. They want to go one way. I know they need to go the other. If they go the way they're insisting on, we're headed right back out to where the first two co-eds were murdered. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all I gotta do is relax and they'll take me to their death. I've got the gun in the car, the same one I've been doing it with. I insisted, as gently as I could, I took them where they needed to go, to their college. It was one week before I murdered my mother. I said, she's gotta die and I've gotta die or girls like that are gonna die. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. And she went out to a party. She got soused. She came home, went to sleep. I was woken up by that. I got, came out. I walked up to her bed. She's laying there reading a paperback. As many thousands of nights before. And she said, oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Shit. I looked at her. I said, no. I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her. You know? And I'm so cold. It's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. It hurts. Because I'm not a lizard. I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina. See? Came out of my mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son. This is one of our arguments. And I cut off her head. And, I'm, and I humiliated her corpse. It's there. You know? Six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? Years, I had been looking at pornography, foreign women, sexualizing them in situations. I had built up a a lot of fantasies about grabbing a woman out of a convenience store, taking her somewhere secluded, and raping her. This was exciting to me. I, I kept going with that. I masturbated behind this fantasy continuously. It got to a point where I told myself I was either going to do this or I wasn't. I had even tried to commit suicide one time because I thought I was going insane. I finally gave up and said, well, I'm this way. And since I'm this way, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to get comfortable with it. I'm going to do these acts. If I'd been in a store, I may have seen a grown woman, and I'd go home and think about her, raping her, grabbing her out of a store. To me, I could walk in a store. The most obvious thing for me to do and get away with it was just walk up, grab him, and walk off. And that's what I did in this crime. I walked right in the convenience store stuck a gun in the woman's back and walked right out. When I stuck the pistol in my victim's back, the adrenaline rush that I got out of that 
I, I had done drugs before and drank alcohol. Nothing could compare with that rush that I got when I stuck that pistol in her back. It was like my whole world turned upside down. Everything went in slow motion for a few minutes. A lot of times I thought that I was a junkie on my own adrenaline. It may not have been adrenaline, it may have been other chemicals in my body. But I learned how to tap into those things by using my own fear, other people's fear. Uh, and a lot of it came with the deviant behavior. That's the only way I could tap into it. And I wanted that high. The high I got during that crime surprised me. When I stuck that pistol in her back, I almost passed out. The rush was so intense. And it scared me. Because I had already pulled a gun on this woman and stuck it in her back. And for me to pass out, it scared me. You know? Uh, I hadn't anticipated that. Not at all. I thought I would get a high, but not that like that. My victim would have been the next high for me. The progress of my deviant behavior was high. I went from one to another. It was an adrenaline rush for me. I wanted that rush. I had to have it. It's, that's what my thinking was. And the night I committed my crime, when I stuck that pistol in my victim's back, I got a rush like I'd never gotten before. After that, everything had went downhill for me. I was feeling worse about it. Sometimes I question if I would have continued. After that, I thought the rape may not be anything, you know. But I thought if I killed my victim, now that would be a real high. Gerard John Schaefer Jr. was an American murderer and suspected serial killer who was convicted of the 1972 murder and mutilation of two teenage girls in Florida. He is suspected of up to 26 more murders. Described by prosecutor Robert Stone as the most sexually deviant person he had ever encountered, Schaefer was sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment at his 1973 trial to be served at Florida State Prison. While at Florida State, he met Ted Bundy and describes one of the conversations they had in the following interview. Does it really horrify you? Are you a little more cautious about picking up that hitchhiker? You girls, are you a little more cautious about who you pick up in the singles bar and take home? Like Mr. Goodbar, right? Diane Keaton did that very well, but does it... Do you get my drift, what I'm trying to inject an awareness into people through that? They see the deliberate stranger and they see it as entertainment. But Ted was real. He was real, man. He'd kill you and laugh. He enjoyed it. And I could sit there like when I'm sitting with you and talk about it. He relished it. And I'm thinking, wow, this guy, if only, if only you could get his face on a camera when he's talking to me like this in the cage, they say. Was he reliving all the time his murders? Well, I wouldn't say all the time, but I took the, uh, he told me that he had followed my case in the detective magazines and that he had killed two girls in Washington as a copycat crime, so to speak, on the place in Jessup. And I think those were Ott and Naseland. And he, was, he would tell me that he took them up on the logging road and, and strangled them and had sex with their corpses and went back and had sex with their corpses and cut off their heads. Like, it's a tribute. And I'm thinking, you motherfuckers that wrote that. I said, here's the guy who read it, believed your bullshit, and went out and did something like this. And now, 
he's like bragging to me. It wasn't exactly a brag, it was like a tribute. How many did you get, really, Jerry? They said 34. Did they get all of them? Or did he have private graveyards? <laughs> I said, Dad, I'm the best. What can I say to somebody like that, right? What can you say? I, I, you're, you're left without any kind of rational response because if you say, Ted, it's all bullshit, he's going to say, no, it's not. I know. And he knew, see, because he had lived it. And I hadn't lived it except through what was written about me. And he was doing it based on what he had read. So he, he had 36. <laughs> he wanted to be the best. And he was obsessed because they said I had 34. And he was afraid that I had ones that he didn't know about. Say, and he was always trying to get me to say, no, that's all I got, 34. You know? <laughs> but I never would say that. I, I discerned that he was concerned about the number. Gerald is a sadistic sex offender who has raped and molested over 300 children. He was convicted in 1994 and sentenced to 45 years in prison. In the following interview, he gives gruesome details of how he abused his family, especially his nine-year-old stepson. After about two years of molesting my son, and all the pornography that I had been buying, renting, swapping. I had gotten my hands on some bondage and discipline pornography with children involved. And uh, some of the reading that I had done and the pictures that I had seen showed total submission, uh, forcing the children to do what I wanted. And I had eventually started using some of this bondage and discipline with my own son. And uh, it had escalated to the point where I was putting a large Ziploc bag over his head and taping it around his neck with black duct tape or black electrical tape and raping and molesting him at that point uh, to the point that he would turn blue, pass out. Uh, at that point, I would rip the bag off his head uh, not for fear of hurting him, but because of the excitement. I was extremely aroused by inflicting pain. And uh, when I seen him pass out and change colors, that was very arousing and heightening to me. And I would rip the bag off his head, and then I'd jump up on his chest, and I'd masturbate in his face and, and uh, make him suck my penis while he was, you know, as he started to come back awake, while he was coughing and choking, I would rape him in the mouth. I, uh, I used the same sadistic style act of the plastic bag and the tape two, three times a week, and that went on for, I'd say, a little over a year. If I hadn't been arrested when I was, my stepson would be dead. I would have killed him. I had been fantasizing about killing a victim during the course of, of rape or molest about five or six months uh, all during the course of the molestation of my stepson when I was using the zip or the plastic bag over his head uh, I had fantasized and thought about killing him, letting him go ahead and suffocate during the process of the molestation uh, I believe it would have been maybe as short as another month or two, and I would have actually killed him if I was not arrested. Despite being reported to authorities several times, nobody believed the child. They always took Gerald's side. Reported to my wife and my parents uh, probably six or seven different times. Uh, and there was actually one instance where I went to the police station myself to turn, my turn myself in. And the police day, the officer at the desk told me to go home and sleep off my drunk. And I left. 
uh, if it wasn't for the fact that they had found, my landlord had found some pornographic pictures of my son in the attic of the home where we were living, I would probably still be molesting. I've been raping and molesting for over a period of 25 years and I have in excess of 300 victims. Hands-on victims? All hands-on victims. Okay. How did you get access to so many victims? Uh, children are on the street all the time. I made, uh, created my own opportunities. There were children at stores. Uh, I had picked some children up at the stores, at the uh, penny arcades, and I have snatched some off the street. Now, did you, by pick them up, do you mean by grooming, you talk them into it, or do you mean violently grab them and kidnap them? Sometimes there, there had been some violent kidnapping snatching a child off the street, pulling him into my car, taking him to a deserted area, raping and molesting him, and then taking him back to where I had snatched him from. Uh, there had been uh, incidents where I would groom the child with toys, money. I'd see a child in a store uh, standing around the, the toy displays, and I would offer to buy the toy that this child may, may be looking at and would actually walk up to the counter and pay for the toy and walk out of the store with the child and the toy. And then I would, after, right after I had taken the child to a deserted area or a, whole, a house that I had actually fixed, fixed up for the purpose of raping and molesting children, I would take the child back to the store where I had got him from and leave him off at the front door and leave. Gerald managed to cover his tracks by leading a double life. His friends, workmates, and associates had no idea about what he was doing. I believe I, I feel more that I led a triple life. Uh, okay. I had to be, I was one way at home, I was one way at work, and I was a different way in the community. Uh, when I was at home, I was a molesting monster. I would rape and molest. Uh, when I was in the community, I was more of a stalker. I would be stalking people, stalking children, looking for victims. Uh, when I was more with uh, my employers or the in crowd that I was in, it was something, I was completely different as, oh, I'm the perfect individual, you know, have a good paying job, drive a nice car, dress nice, and uh, go to a lot of high class, fancy places. Uh, and this is the life, this is what I would portray to the people that I wanted them to see, my friends, my employers, uh, business associates. This is what I would portray to them. What people didn't know about going out of my home was uh, a lot of extreme violence. Beating my son up, uh, beating my wife up. If my wife wouldn't have sex with me when I wanted it, where I, or how I wanted it, I would beat her up and then rape her after I'd beat her. I had beaten my son into unconsciousness a number of times. Uh, and then I would keep him sometimes kept locked up in the house until his bruises healed up. Keep him away from school, keeping him away from his friends. Nobody around me knew what I was doing. Nobody around my community knew that I was such a violent individual in the home. If they did, they never said anything, but I don't believe they ever knew because I was completely and totally different outside of the house once I left the home. I, I devalued all, all children, both step-in biological children and other ch others' children, uh, mostly others and my stepchild. Uh, I, said my, I told myself that my stepchild, you know, because he wasn't mine, because he wasn't my biological son, that he was less than human anyway. Uh, other people's children that I had raped and molested, they weren't mine. They weren't my biological children. So it didn't make any difference to me. I viewed children as a piece of meat. Just, to, me, to me, children were a toy. Do what I wanted with and then throw it away. Gerald would not only gain sexual pleasure from watching his victims suffering, but would convince himself that the child wanted to be abused. Watch how he explains in detail. The thinking process for that, that I used it with uh, pain and, and 
how arousing I found it was uh, if a child was screaming, uh, I would tell myself that, you know, it's the child's not really hurting because I know I, I ain't all reality. I know I was hurting the child. But the only way that I could continue the act was to tell myself that I wasn't hurting the child. I really wasn't hurting him or her. And I found the more I told myself that, the more I believed it. And then I found that if the child tried to pull away or would scream, holler, cry, and, and all my lying to myself would enhance that and make it more arousing to me. And the pain, the, the aspect of inflicting pain was extremely arousing. It was something that had taken time to build up. It didn't just happen. It took time to build that up. Uh, <clears throat> and after a while, I, would take and, I could actually take and turn it around to the child was screaming because they wanted more. The child was screaming actually because they liked it. Uh, the child was screaming because they wanted me to continue. And it's all turning it around and, and saying that that, uh, well, the tears really aren't real for hurt. The screaming isn't really because of pain. It's that the person actually wants this to happen. And that's how I was turning it around. And I had told myself this so many times that I believed it. And then did you do that at the time, or did you rework it and you <clears> later? When I first found that I was becoming, that I was really aroused to inflicting pain, uh, I didn't have to worry, I, I didn't have it, that line of thinking right then, okay? I knew that I was hurting them. It took me some time, and I worked it through at a later time. I'd, I'd, I'd work it over half hour, hour, 45 minutes, hour and a half later that this child was asking for it, this child wanted more. And the more that I thought about it that way, the more that I looked at it, there came a point in my life after six, seven months of doing this that I didn't even have to change the thought process anymore. The immediate thought process was scream, pain, excitement. They wanted it. There was no change after that. I had told myself so much I, that I had built it into it. It was a built-in thinking process at that process at that point that that child was crying, screaming, because they wanted me to inflict the pain. No matter how much I hurt them, there, was, there were incidents and cases of where uh, tissue had been torn, blood, and I know there was pain, but I had no remorse for it. I didn't feel sorry for it. I was aroused to that. And the child screaming made the arousal even higher. At the time, I didn't have any feelings for anybody other than myself. I wanted me to feel good and it didn't make a difference who hurt in the process as long as I felt good uh, I had I was very apathetic I had very little feelings for anybody at that point in my life I don't think I had empathy for any anybody uh, including myself uh, I'm not even sure I knew what empathy was at that point uh, I didn't care about other people's feelings. I didn't care for other people, period. Serial killers and sex offenders are everywhere, and they hit when you least expect it. Take care. Thanks for watching this video to the end. We would like to hear from you, so please leave a comment and we shall get back to you. Don't forget to subscribe.